Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a preview of our ClassicsToday.com insider special video, The 10 Best Recordings of Eugene Ormandy. Now, if you are not a ClassicsToday.com subscriber, you know the spiel. You can subscribe either on the homepage of ClassicsToday.com or by following the link in the description of this very video. And that is all I'm going to say about it because I know you want to subscribe. I would. Anyway, let's talk about Eugene Ormandy, the late, great Eugene Ormandy. Oh my goodness. He was a brilliant conductor and a far better and more important one than people give him credit for. And I want to spend a little time talking about his significance in American musical life and as a model for perhaps some other conductors. Let's, let's, just, let's just start with American orchestras in the 1950s. Now, it's very difficult in this international world for people to remember, and if you're starting out in the classical musical world or came to it late, that the universe in the middle of the 20th century was so different from what it later became. I mean, I vividly remember in the 1980s when I was going to the, the MIDEM um, convention in Cannes, France. MIDEM is Marché International du Disque et Edition Musicale. You know, it's was the big, huge, global music industry convention. And even at that point in the mid-80s, independent labels and were all looking for distribution. There were, you know, records and music were physical product. It was physical product. And you needed to have distributors. In every country, you needed somebody else. And we still have that today, but there are many, many fewer of them. And of course, digital availability of everything internationally has completely changed how music is distributed and consumed. But in those days, it was heavy, and it was LPs and CDs, and it weighed a ton, and you had to make distribution arrangements, and that was in the 80s. In the 50s and 60s, things were even more fragmented because Record labels, even the major labels, the so-called majors, the Sonys, which was CBS, or Columbia, RCA, EMI, HMV, they were local labels. And they had distribution arrangements in various other countries. But when I was growing up, when I was a kid, in the late 60s and early 70s, when I started collecting music, for example, Deutsche Grammophon, Philips, Decca, they were imports. They were expensive. <laughs> And, you know, the, the local stuff was less expensive. And frankly, I, I mean, the pressings were usually awful. American pressings were notoriously bad. But the artistic quality was as high as anything. And the only reason we bought imports was because they were European. And we naturally thought European must be better because it's European. Oh, how wrong we were. But we didn't know any better. I mean, that was the point. And Ormandy was one of the guys that you, he was just naturally who you turned to. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see a sort of corollary to that whole thing when we talk about the, you know, the actual recordings on classics today. But the point I want to make now is, is if you turn to the 1950s, America traditionally had five great orchestras. And those orchestras, it was a pretty amazing time because America had not suffered the orchestras, in any case, the depredations of World War II, the way... Europe had, number one, so the orchestras had not been decimated. In fact, if anything, they'd been enhanced because Central Europe lost all of its Jewish players and conductors, and think about who they were. Bruno Walter, Otto Klemper, George Sell, Fritz Reiner. I mean, they were, it was, it was the great Jewish migration. And then there were all the, the orchestra members who went to Israel to form the Palestine Symphony, the Israel Philharmonic, and into the American orchestras. It was, it was an extraordinary time and an extraordinary loss of manpower for that reason alone. And then, of course, there was the destruction wrought by the war and the simple lack of money to support all of this orchestral activity because in the United States, orchestras were funded by rich people. We didn't really have any government support. They had charitable giving and charitable foundations, and they raised money, and they had rich old ladies from old families who ran the women's auxiliary, and they raised money, and I mean, that's how the American orchestras kept themselves going. And the smart ones, like the Boston Symphony, for example, accumulated enormous endowments. I mean, billion-dollar endowments to keep themselves going. 
And so uh, they were in a very, very different financial condition from the European orchestras, which grew out of the aristocratic orchestra system and which became government subsidy. The government took over from the aristocracy and supported the arts institutions, but not here. And so they were financially in much better shape as well. And so think about the 1950s and the top five American orchestras. You had Zell in Cleveland, 50s and early 60s, right? At Zell in Cleveland, you had Kusevitsky, then Munch in Boston. You had Bruno Walter in Metropolis and then Bernstein in New York. You had Ormandy in Philadelphia, and you had Reiner in Chicago, ultimately. And that was some lineup, really, wasn't it? And all of them had their specialties, in a sense. You know, Zell had the German, the German standard repertoire. Bernstein and the New Yorkers, they had Mahler and, and the American repertoire. And Reiner had Richard Strauss, and sort of those, those orchestral firework things that he did so well. And, and who am I forgetting? Oh, there was, no, we got Chicago. We got, I've covered most of them. But Philadelphia, what was Ormandy's specialty? That's an interesting question because Ormandy did everything. He just did everything. He did everything all the others did. And he, and he did it very well, but there wasn't any one thing that you could say was uniquely his. Maybe Tchaikovsky, maybe like the late Russian romantics, perhaps. But the truth of the matter is, Ormandy was the ultimate generalist conductor. And that was his strength. And also, subsequently, you know, posthumously, in a way, his weakness. Because people argue that the other conductors who had certain specialties were more exciting or more trenchant or more something than Ormandy was. Ormandy had his orchestra and his sound. And he outlasted all of those others. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, by the early 60s, Reiner and Munch were gone. Ormandy was still there. Zell made it to 1970, but Ormandy was still there, you know, cranking him out. And Bernstein left in the late 60s, and Ormandy was still there. And what Ormandy achieved in that period was a unique bond of trust between himself and the record-buying public. Ormandy and Philadelphia in the United States were synonymous for a certain level of quality, and it was a real level of quality. This was not a, it was not a, a, a sales pitch. It was very, very real because what Ormandy offered, yes, he may not have been as thrilling as Bernstein or he may not have been as exciting in, in Beethoven and Brahms or as you know, intensely slashing as Zell had been, but, but he was damn near as good and he was never bad, ever. And what's more, he cultivated a characteristic sound with his orchestra and you got the sound when you bought the record. Now, not every type of repertoire responded to the sound with the same sort of, um, you know, effectiveness as other types of repertoire. But it was a very effective sound and it was adaptable. It wasn't like the same thing every time for everybody, no matter what. It wasn't like Ormandy was an ignoramus and he didn't know that you, you played Beethoven differently than you played Rachmaninoff. It wasn't that at all. It was within certain parameters. There, were, there was a certain amount of leeway, depending on what repertoire was being done. But there's more to it than that. And this is what I think makes Ormandy even more interesting and more important because, you know, as the European orchestras got themselves together, Ormandy and Philadelphia were, in a very real sense, the model. You know, Ormandy was sometimes known as the, you know, American Carrion for his love of a beautiful sound above all. But the truth is just the opposite. The truth is that Carrion was the European Ormandy because Ormandy had already been there for a good decade and a half or so before Carrion popped up. And not only that, but Carrion's repertoire and interests were so much more limited than Ormandy's were. Despite their love of making a beautiful sound, Ormandy was the ultimate considerate colleague as an accompanist. Carrion didn't get along with anybody. It was him or nobody. It was his way or the highway. You know, Carrion re-recorded the same stuff over and over again endlessly. 
Ormandy also did a lot of re-recording of, for example, Tchaikovsky symphonies and other things. However, and this is the big however, Ormandy's range of interest and repertoire was limitless. He was more than happy to fill in the gaps that other people left open. Think, for example, of the Nielsen symphonies on Sony. I mean, who was doing Nielsen symphonies, right? You had, you had Bernstein who did two, four, and five, and three. Two, three, four, five. Who was going to do one and six? Ormandy. He did them. And he did them quite well. How many people turned to Ormandy's Nielsen Symphonia Semplice? But he did it. And he was willing to do that kind of thing for any composer at all. It's astonishing when you think about it. He did Tchaikovsky's seventh, that completion, that weird completion. He did, he, he did the Mahler 10, the Cook completion. Ormandy wanted to do premieres. He wanted to do new stuff. He wanted to be the first. And it, you knew that if Ormandy did it, it was going to be good. They were going to get the treatment. And the treatment was as high class a treatment as you could possibly offer. There wasn't anyone in the world, in, in the world, who could do something so well the first time through, especially unfamiliar repertoire. And Ormandy knew it, and he was able to take his audience with him. And that's what I think is so marvelous about him and where I think his significance really lies. He had an unprecedented range of repertoire and willingness to let his, tell his audience to bring them along doing things that they might not have known. And, you know, some of it may not have been very popular, but he did it. And I'll give you some examples. And my examples are all coming from recordings that are not in my list of his 10 best, but they're still marvelous recordings. And they're all on RCA. This was the period after his heyday with Columbia, when he remade tons and tons of stuff for RCA. And it wasn't supposed to be as good right? That was what they said. It was not as good. It was getting old. It was getting slower. Some of it was. Some of it wasn't. Welcome to the real world. What do you think was going to happen, right? But let's, let's look at these things. They are some extraordinary recordings. First, ah, Shostakovich's Bobby Yar. This was effectively the recording premiere because the piece had been banned in Russia, and it was only finally recorded by Kondrashina in the revised version with the text changed. How did Ormandy get his hands on it? Well, Rostropovich smuggled it out of the Soviet Union and gave it to Ormandy so that he could do the premiere. And really, it, it's just amazing. This is billed as the courageous symphony of protest by two of the Soviet Union's most important angry men, a major work of and for our time. How's that for a little bit of wonderful puffery? It's a very good performance. It's not the best performance, but it's a very good performance. You can play this and you, you get the piece quite well. It's extremely well done. And this was effectively the world premiere recording of a new work. Let's not forget, no, it wasn't avant-garde, crazy, squeak, bloop, doobity doo you know, that kind of nonsense. It wasn't by Stockhausen, but it was brand new music. But the important thing is that Ormandy for years had been doing Shostakovich. He did the, he'd already done symphonies one, four, five, ten, you know. So by the time he came to these last ones for RCA, he had, he'd established himself as a Shostakovich conductor, a fine Shostakovich conductor, and people were willing to go with him. And I was one of them. I had his early recordings and I thought, gee, this is really cool. New symphonies by Shostakovich. And then he did, of course, number 14. Now, these last three were released in a box. Can you imagine 13, 14, and 15 all in a box, one after the other? That was a mouthful. These are challenging symphonies. And these, this is with Phyllis Curtin and Simon Estes. And since I went to high school with Phyllis Curtin's daughter, and she used to come and do master classes with us all the time, we, we heard some of this when she was doing it, if not from her, from her, then from her daughter, who would sing bits of it in the student lounge. And also here is Benjamin Britten, the 4C Interludes in Pasacalia from Peter Grimes, which in 1970, uh, whatever this was, was not exactly a uh, standard rep either. And those are quite well done. And then, of course, there is Shostakovich 15. And the coupling here is even more interesting. Bartok's four pieces for orchestra, which were as good as unknown until Ormandy did them. I mean, really unknown.
And this is still an extraordinary performance. You would be hard pressed to find something better. And I mean it, it's, it's just marvelous. So, and the 15th is great and the Bartok is great. And Bartok of course was an Ormandy, an Ormandy specialty. Another one that he did very, very loyally. But then I've got like these other things to look at. Another composer that he championed at a time when really few people were doing it except Bernstein was Charles Ives. Here we've got symphonies numbers two and three um, I don't find this performance of number two particularly compelling. It's a little bit on the logy side. It's a little slow, but three is quite lovely. Ormandy had already done number one for Sony when nobody was doing number one because Bernstein had done two and three, Stokowski had done number four, and they needed somebody to round out the Ives cycle. And so who did they get? Ormandy. And then we have, let's see, what was this? Oh. This is the Holiday Symphony and the Three Places in New England. This is first class. This is as great an Ives disc as anybody ever did. And there was no other performance of the complete Holiday Symphony at the time. And I believe this Three Places in New England was the first performance of one of the original, quasi-original-ish type orchestrations, you know, the larger version, I think. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, the competition was very limited, and having Ormandy and Philly doing this stuff was going to bring a whole new audience into, into Ives's orbit. And so it proved, because I was one of them, part of that whole new audience. And now let's see what else we have here. The Manfred Symphony. Tchaikovsky's Manfred Symphony. I mean, back in the day when Ormandy recorded this, Manfreds were not easy to come by. Think about it. Markevich was on Phillips. And Phillips was as good as invisible in the United States. It was very hard to get your hands on. And it wasn't even in the catalog for Phillips for that long. And you could get a Rush to Zvensky one on Melodia, which had a licensing arrangement in those days with EMI Angel Records. So that was around. But having Ormandy do it was an entirely new level of interpretive excellence, especially given his love of Tchaikovsky. And this was the kind of thing that Ormandy was willing to do. He would dig around with a composer who he'd spent quite a bit of time with and look for things that he hadn't done yet, and he would record them. And so it would be a wonderful thing for collectors who love the composers and might not have known these, these off-the-beaten-path works. And finally, we have this one. This is, this is a great record, I have to say. This is Penderecki's Utrenia. The Entombment of Christ. That's not exactly a household work, you know. But here's Ormandy doing, well, I think it's a premiere performance of it, or one of them for sure, world premiere recordings of a thrilling sonic experience. And so it is, maybe not in the way that most people expected, but it is a thrilling sonic experience. And you also get on here um, Vincent Persichetti's Symphony No. 9. Persichetti was a wonderful composer. This is the Symphonia Janiculum, which is quite Janiculum, whatever it's called. It's quite interesting. And again, here you have it. Ormandy and Philadelphia doing it. And so many people wound up sitting around with recordings of Penderecki's Utrania because Ormandy did it. And that was all. It was just because his name and the Philadelphia name were on the record people were willing to take him on trust. And you can't, there is no substitute for trust. There truly isn't. Uh, you know, especially in the world of classical music, which not only is a question of people investing a large amount of time and a huge range of styles and media and forms, but also, also the real fear people have about classical music, that what they listen to is somehow reflective of their taste. And if they don't, make the right pick, then they're somehow inferior human beings. I mean, you can't ignore the, so the social and cultural nonsense that comes with it. And Ormandy gave everyone cover. You knew that if you had Ormandy in Philadelphia, that was a good thing. You were getting top quality. Now, of course, now, especially in the critical fraternity, people poo-poo Ormandy and they say, oh, well, you know, other people were more exciting and there are more than 400 recordings of it. Why listen to Ormandy's? But that wasn't the case when Ormandy was actually most active. And we're talking about basically the 1960s and maybe the first half of the 70s. At that time, what he did really mattered. He was a big fish in a big pond. 
And uh, I, I think that we need to give him credit for that. We need to give him credit for establishing a standard below which he never fell, number one, and number two, for using his position very, very shrewdly to allow people to expand their knowledge, expand their horizons, to get into the music in a, in a depth that no other conductor alive at the same time was able or willing to do. And that is an extraordinary accomplishment. And so uh, as we go on to classicstoday.com, as some of you anyway, and I hope more of you will hop over there and look at his 10 best recordings, I think you should keep that in mind. He really was a remarkable, remarkable man and a model for quite a few other conductors who, who came after him. The most, I think the best known is, is Leonard Slatkin, who has a similar wide range of repertoire and a willingness to explore things um, that you know, other conductors won't do. Slatkin expresses open admiration for Ormandy for just that reason. And, and I think that that is a very, very shrewd observation and an important one. That's why Slatkin spent so much time in St. Louis trying to develop the relationship between himself and his audience, both the local audience and the larger audience through recordings. Nowadays, nobody does that, nobody cares. And as a result, the repertoire in, on recordings is shrinking. It's shrinking all the time, it seems. People do the same stuff. That's why everyone is playing Bruckner. Everyone is playing the same few things, small things. And, you know, Ormond did tons of stuff. You will never hear a conductor today who does that range of repertoire and does it so well. Whether you like everything you did or don't like everything you did, or if everything is someone else did it better, it doesn't mean anything. What matters is that his achievement was really pretty unique. And I think it deserves recognition as such. And so with that, I turn you loose to join me over at classicstoday.com for Ormandy's 10 best recordings. Keep on listening, folks. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.